Hey, good evening. It's a little bit after six o'clock. I'm Rob Redker, superintendent of Cheney Public Schools. Also joining me tonight in the presentation is Annie Wolfley, our director of teaching and learning. And we're here to share our reopening work and plan um, with our community. And so first of all, I just wanna thank you for being here this evening and taking the time to participate in this webinar. Um, I know it's been a difficult spring and a summer with the COVID situation and the, the situation that we're facing with our school and school district. And while we announced distance learning on Monday as the way we will start the fall and school in 2020, 2021, I want you to know that we know that our students need to be on campus and we want our students on campus and we're gonna work hard to make that happen when it is safe to do so. So I'll, I'll begin and then Annie will um, take over after about four or five slides. So again, welcome. And our meetings and our work um, with our administrators, with our school board, with our staff, uh, we start with our school miss mission statement first. And so for Cheney Public Schools, while our work may look different this fall due to the current situation that we're in, and I wanna say look different in a temporary way too. This is not a permanent situation. And we know that our mission is still the same within our school district. And a couple of words are in bold there and guarantee a safe and caring environment. And while the mission may look different in how we um, approach it, this is still the work of our school district and still ensuring that all stu students learn at high level, graduate with options for post-secondary ed education, careers, and civic engagement. So next slide, please, Annie. When discussing the reopening process, I wanted to share a little bit with you this evening of exactly what that looked like. And so we determined some guiding principles, which we'll look at here in a moment. We had parent thought exchange as we discussed last spring, how the first continuous learning, remote learning went for parents and students to get feedback. We had a parent survey in June. We established a reopening committee, which contained staff and a variety of different folks to be able to provide input. We had a second parent survey in July, as we heard that some opinions were potentially shifting. And then we also surveyed our staff um, with Thought Exchange and Google. And Annie will touch on these a little bit more in a couple of slides. So next slide, please, Annie. The guiding principles, whenever you're looking at a significant process like determining the best way to open schools in the safest way, we need to prioritize what that looks like in the filter through which we make decisions. And of course, our mission statement is one of those, but these are the guiding principles that we developed within that reopening process. And the first, they're prioritizing the health and safety of all students, families in the community, social emotional needs, um, equity within the district, still maintaining high standards for all students. Um, and then a big one was considering the scheduling needs of our families. And I know a distance learning model is going to put a strain on our families with regard to schedules and childcare and some of those things. And we're very aware as we're making decisions and taking those things into consideration. Um, the next piece, opening for face-to-face -face in person instruction. We started with that as our goal. I'm wanting to be on site as much as possible. And that was one of our guiding principles as we went through this process. Um, providing online learning for those who would choose that. There were um, several within our surveys that had mentioned that they wanted online because of the situation, regardless of if we came back on site. And of course, collaborating with other school districts in our region, and we do so regularly, um, many in our central office staff, communicating openly with our stakeholders. I um, hope you feel that we communicate frequently and openly with our public. Um, we don't have anything to hide and we try to share as much information as possible. And then of course, allocating resources to meet our student needs. So I'll turn it over to Annie at this time and she'll touch a little bit on the survey data. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm gonna talk just briefly about the surveys that we um, did put out and gathered together information from the community and from staff. Uh, these were critical as we were meeting with our reopening committee and talking through the guidance um, and the regulations, uh, both from OSPI and the Department of Health. Um, so we started with a parent thought exchange uh, in the beginning of June, where we received a lot of feedback around 
um, how the spring went, um, things that parents appreciated or liked, and then things that didn't work well for families. Um, and, we, and we were able to use that information as we're starting to figure out how to frame our distance learning um, through the next school year. We also did, and I don't have this written on here, but we did some focus group Zoom meetings with parents, with high school students, with middle school students, um, and got a lot of information, really candid thoughts, um, especially from our students around uh, what was working well for them and what they'd like to see changed in the future. We did that first parent survey just to get that initial idea. Um, and as Rob shared, it really helped us to know how many people, even in that time, were really thinking about focusing on um, a distance learning model, not sending their students back to school. Um, it was the first time we really got to share out information around what the Department of Health guidelines were. Um, and we got a lot of feedback um, and a lot of um, input on what those guidelines were and what, what parents and families were comfortable with and not comfortable with within those guidelines. As we were working with our committee, um, we started to get to the point where our numbers um, in Spokane County were changing um, and maybe we thought opinions might be changing of what school might look like. Um, so we did another survey to help inform our staff that were working on this reopening team. Um, the number of parents who actually changed their mind from one mode of learning to another was uh, pretty overwhelming at that point. Um, there were less people uh, willing to send their students back to school full time and that was informa good information for us to know. We also did a staff survey. We gathered input um, from staff around their fears, their concerns, um, also around what professional development they believe they need as a staff so that we can prepare um, in August to provide that professional development. And we did a thought exchange um, with, with staff also where, where we were able to gather information about um, what, how they were thinking and feeling at this time um, and what things they were hearing out in the community also. So and that- Before we go into the next piece, can I say something really quickly? Yes, of course. One of the things um, that's come up in recent days, and I think it's a very fair question is, you know, you surveyed the public and a specific uh, percentage of our population said we want to be back on site and another uh, specific amount said a hybrid option and others said online. And so then, you know, why did you make the determination to go to a distance model if 70% of our parents said that um, we wanted to be on site? And I think that's a very fair question. And I, I've struggled with this. I know the trust of our parents and our community is, is important. And we want to know what people um, desire and what they want from our education system. And when we try to weigh these things with a recommendation from the local health department and how does that factor in? And, and these are difficult decisions and I want you to know the decisions that we struggled with and those are fair questions to ask. Thank you. Um, so next, um, to give you just a little bit of an overview of what our um, reopening team explored, uh, we spent some time looking at three different models uh, a full-time in-person model, what, what that would entail, what that would look like, if we could even physically fit um, back all of our students or the number of students that wanted to return uh, full-time in person. Uh, and then that team, uh, we had a break off of that team and they really examined it from every angle, from safety, from teaching and learning, um, from what the expectations of students would be, how, how we would uh, get them around the building, um, then we had another group that looked at a hybrid model, K-12, um, and what that might look like, where students would be in person some of the time and in distance learning some of the time. Um, we also looked at a full-time K-5, wanting to get our earliest learners um, the most amount of time uh, as possible with, with teachers in person, and then a 6-12 hybrid uh, model. So we evaluated all of these models. We, we went through the process, had some really great conversations, input and feedback from, um, from those, the teachers and administrators that were on that team. Uh, we also did spend some time, uh, we did some webinars or um, Zoom meetings with staff members, with parents, community members, um, to gather that kind of 
face to face or what we can gather face to face in a zoom environment um, to hear about thoughts um, on the plans and that was really amazing feedback also um, and gave us an idea about where some of our um, parents were landing and what their thoughts were. Annie, can you go back real quick? I'm sorry. About four to six weeks ago within this process. So worst case scenario, I felt like for our school district was that we would start full time K five and have a hybrid six twelve model. I really had my mindset that that's that's probably where we're going to get to start. And I was excited by that. I know we need to be back in school. And then as the COVID situation this summer continued to um, worsen within Spokane County, I started to think, okay, maybe not quite that way, but maybe a, a K-12 hybrid situation is still possible for our, our system. And, and then within the last couple of weeks in meetings with Dr. Lutz and the health department and others, seeing how things have changed within our county has really um, changed to where we're at today with this distance model. So I really want to reiterate we started with the intention of trying to bring students back as much as possible because we know how important that is for our students and families. So we developed um, over time the stages of uh, reopening in this conditional plan. Um, we knew, heard about uh, the fact that there was going to be something, some guidance coming from the Department of Health. Um, on what conditions we would have to have in order to, to open or to have um, students back in person. Uh, so we developed this plan um, with the different stages. I'm gonna break it down um, just quickly for you here. Uh, the first two stages are around full distance learning. Um, and we really feel that both in both of these stages, this would be something mandated by the state or local agencies. This is not a situation we want to be in. Um, and the first one would be that all students and staff would participate in distance learning and that school buildings would be closed, similar to how they were uh, back in March when we had the stay home, stay healthy order. Uh, stage two would be um, a, a scenario where we'd be able to bring staff back into buildings. Um, that was really prohibitive for our teachers uh, last year to not be able to be in their classrooms and have their materials as accessible. Then the, the next three stages, stage three, four, and five, um, really are around a hybrid learning model. Um, we did a lot of research and studying around this on our reopening committee, um, and we, we felt that we needed to have some different stages um, that went along with this. So um, as you have heard, and um, especially in emails that have gone home and from our board meeting on Monday evening, stage three is the stage where we've landed on for right, right now. Um, for our school district and that is that all students will participate in distance learning and students in the greatest need of additional support, those that are furthest away from educational justice, um, will come in for some in in person instruction and I'm going to talk about a little bit about that criteria, um, the draft of, that we have of that criteria a little bit later on uh, in the webinar. Then we see um, that that would help us to, to start having some students back in the building and move into stage four um, when we are allowed to do so. And in stage four, that would be bringing in um, our youngest learners, so some form of preschool through fifth grade to attend in person some of the time and in distance learning some of the time. And then our students in grades six through 12 would participate in distance learning at that point. And then in stage five, because we would have had P5 in that um, hybrid model, we would feel, feel like we could bring back um, all kindergarten through fifth grade uh, five days a week. Uh, preschool doesn't attend five days a week as it is, so um, that would be just their regular schedule. And then our six through 12 would participate in a hybrid where they, where they would be in the building some of the time um, and, and distance learning for some of the time. And then our last stage really um, is where we hope to get to, and that would be that all students and staff would participate with in-person instruction. Um, also noting though that this isn't a return to quote unquote normal in stage six either. Um, we anticipate that that would still mean physical distancing, that would still mean wearing of masks um, and following the Department, Health, uh, Department of Health guidance. Some things to note, um, distance learning will be, will be available in all of these stages. So families that choose to have distance learning and do not 
want to send their students back in the building, we will have uh, distance learning available um, within our district taught by Cheney School District teachers. And that's one of the, obviously one of the things that we're working on right now. Um, we feel that we could go back and forth between the stages, um, depending on the situation in our county. Um, and we received a lot of information about that today uh, in the governor's press conference. So we feel, we feel pretty confident um, that we can go in between the stages and we're working on planning what those hybrid and distance learning models will look like. All right, thank you, Annie. An important part of our process and planning has been meetings with the Department of Health, Spokane Regional Health Department. Uh, today was the fourth week in a row that we have met with Dr. Lutz and Mark Springer from Spokane Regional Health Department. Uh, one of the things that superintendents and school district leaders were asking for were some guidance around the health situation. Uh, many of us educators, and we feel like we know education well, but we are not health experts and we're seeking some type of metrics, some type of information that we could use as we make decisions about the school year. And recently on Monday, Dr. Lutz provided school districts with this letter that you see before you. And so um, he had made a strong recommendation at the end. I'm not gonna read the entire letter, but his recommendation was based on our rates, the existing science regarding COVID-19 and school reopening, I strongly recommend beginning the year in remote continuous learning for all students consider in-person learning for those who have special health or education needs that cannot be delivered through remote learning. And so that was his recommendation on Monday, which happened to coincide with our school board meeting that we had already scheduled, and also um, coincided with, we had said to the public that we would provide our information about the fall on August 3rd. So all of this kind of came together on that um, certain day. So next slide, please, Annie. Part of what we had been hearing about was this metrics that would be tied to the COVID situation. Like how do we know when it's safe to be able to reopen for certain activities? What would make it safe to be on site completely in person? Really looking for some of that guidance. About a week ago, it was shared with us that we're gonna be looking at low, moderate, and high activity. Today, the governor in a press conference with Superintendent Reichdahl and the State Department of Health put some numbers to that metric. And so what they would consider low COVID activity is less than 25 cases per 100,000 residents in a county over a two week period. For a little bit of reference, Spokane County has about 530,000 re residents. Um, for moderate COVID activity, they're saying between 25 and 75 cases per 100,000 over 14 days. And where they would consider it high COVID activity is over 75 cases per 100,000 residents over 14 days. And we are seeking specific activities within school that we'd be able to do within each one of these metrics. So within low, they're saying consider hybrid or full-time in-person learning if we can get to those numbers within the county. With moderate, consider in-person hybrid or distance learning, so potentially a hybrid situation for our youngest learners and students who need the most support. With high activity, the recommendation from the governor's office as well as Spokane Regional Health Department is consider remote learning, with in-person learning for small groups and the highest risk children. Next slide, please. This will just give a, a little bit of a reference with regard to the county numbers. So when you see the low, moderate, and high and the rates um, per 100,000, today in Spokane County, per 100,000 residents, the number is 215 new cases on a 14-day rolling average. So what that means is if the state is saying that a high rate of activity is 75 and above, we are more than double what that rate would be to be considered high activity. Um, to be in that moderate range where we could have hybrids between 25 and 75. If you look at the screen, at the very bottom you see a dotted line. And so this dotted line was helping to understand when we would move from stage one to stage two as a county. So when Spokane County was able to move from stage one to stage two, and that occurred about Memorial Day. And so if you look at what that range was, it was basically around that 25 per 100,000 rate. And then after we moved into phase two, you see that COVID numbers started to escalate. And then today up to 215 per 100,000 over for a 14 day average. So it just gives you an idea of where we're at in the county. Um, also gives you hope though, 
if within moderate and low activity, we can bring students back on campus. Look, we were, we were actually there in June. We were actually there in May and April. We've done this before within our county and I have confidence that we can do it again to be able to bring our students back on campus. So sometimes these things seem insurmountable, but this gives me hope that there is an opportunity for our students to be back on campus because we know that's what needs to occur. All right, go ahead, Annie. So we've been meeting with a distance learning work group. Um, we're meeting again tomorrow. We have a three hour Zoom meeting scheduled. Um, and what we wanna share with you is um, just a basic idea of what the options um, that we're exploring are. Um, we've looked for guidance um, from other districts, not just across the state, but across the country um, around what they're offering and how we might be able to offer some of those um, in Cheney. So we kind of have two different um, ideas for the distance learning. One is that it would be a, um, you could choose a teacher paste um, and, and that would consist of a regular school day uh, with students accessing their teachers. Um, and then another option would be self-paced. We've heard loud and clear that um, there are many people in the community who aren't necessarily going to be accessible for their students to support during the daytime. Um, so that, that idea of a self-paced, um, where if your student does need some support and has you at home um, or older siblings or whatever that might look like. Um, and then the other thing is, um, we're gonna have to do a survey and find out from, from you um, as families, when we are able to return in person, would you choose to return in person or would you choose to stay in a distance learning model? And part of the reason we need to know that is to need to know how to assign teachers um, to groups of students because the goal would be to have a teacher stay with a group of students for the entire year. So we will be gathering that information from you. We'll have more information on what the specifics are and the expectations around each of those models. So we've had some subgroups working um, together to talk about what will be the structure of Google Classroom. We heard loud and clear from feedback um, that having one platform makes a really huge difference. Having one platform for families who have multiple students, for students who have multiple classes that they're taking, um, just having that structure of commonality makes a really big difference. Uh, so that is something that we're planning to have kind of a template that all teachers would use to set up their Google Classrooms. We also are talking about what the weekly expectations will be for teachers and weekly expectations for students. This will be vastly different from what it was in the spring um, for, or from March on. The expectations will be much higher in terms of time commitment, um, in terms of how much time teachers will be devoted to providing synchronous and asynchronous learning. Synchronous learning is live Zoom type meetings and asynchronous would be perhaps videos that, that students could rewatch um, over again or pause and um, during the teaching process to learn a little bit more. So these are things that are being explored by our distance learning work group right now. Uh, we plan to have decisions and plans out um, in the coming weeks so that we can share what the, what the specific structures are going to be and the expectations. It's one of the things that we realized that we needed to make some adjustments to was the school year calendar. Um, although we adopt a calendar for a two-year cycle, we know that we can make changes when necessary. What we've done to this particular calendar, and you don't see it in there necessarily in August, but we have front-loaded professional development for our teachers and our staff. We've added four days to August for professional development so that we can work on the online work. We can talk about SEL and equity and all the different training that we need. And those days are scheduled tentatively for August 19th, 20th, and then the 25th and 27th. We have another additional day that's the principal's day that's potentially available to be able to utilize as well for staff development. So altogether, about five days of professional development to support our staff as we prepare for the upcoming school year. Another piece that we struggled with last spring, as you recall, the school year just ended abruptly. It was like a March 13th, the snap of the fingers, we weren't back in school. We did not have the opportunity to meet with families and students and to prepare in a way that we could support. And so what we've done this year is that we've built three days into the first week of September to be able to have in a conference type manner 
to be able to bring parents and students onto campus to meet with teachers or potentially through Zoom if necessary, but to be able to talk about what's the platform we're using, what's the technology, what are the expectations, how do I turn in assignments, what does grading look like, what are the expectations, all of those different things that we know are necessary. So we built time into the calendar to be able to support that. And we're working with the state board and OSPI to allow us to use some time for that because we know it's important for our families, our students, and our staff. Then the first day of distance learning will be September 8th. So originally the first day would have been the second. Now it'll be the day after Labor Day on September 8th. If you look at the school year calendar, we will end on June 16th. But we've also built in some makeup days if necessary to be able to add in. I'm not quite sure what snow days are gonna look like or some of those other things depending on what we're at or where we're at in school on site. Um, but these are, these are the adjustments that we made to the school calendar to be able to support our staff, families, and students as we begin the new school year. One of the biggest questions that we've gotten so far, um, especially since Monday, um, are how is it going to be decided um, who the students are that have a, a need for additional support. So we have a team that's met to start to develop what this criteria looks like. So I have a draft to share with you right now. Um, the four uh, categories, um, if you will, that we are focusing on uh, would be students with significant need for special education services that's noted in their IEP, uh, our English language learners, our homeless and foster youth, and students with significant mental health needs. In, um, in our research and as in our planning for this, we did some, uh, we're able to pull some data around how many students this would be. Um, so for the students uh, who have IEPs, um, the category or the kind of cutoff for what we're looking for there um, to try to serve as many students as possible um, are students who whose IEP indicates greater than 50% of their day in special education. And so we would be looking at potentially a Monday, Wednesday, Friday um, time to support, um, to, to provide services to students. And you can see the numbers across um, for elementary, <coughs> middle school and high school. Then our EL um, students would, would potentially be in a Tuesday, Thursday format. Um, and you can see those numbers across middle, uh, elementary, middle, and high school. We know we have homeless students in our community, foster students, um, who we would be providing extra support for. We have many students who have mental health needs. Um, and some of that may be in the form of coming into a building. Um, some of it may consist of counselors coming for home visits um, or Zoom meetings that are um, set up especially to support students in that way. Um, so you'll see that the total of students that, that we uh, pull together in these lists would be about 333 students. So really looking at our most at risk. Um, and the idea would be that this is the start for us. We also know we have families that don't have um, really good connectivity. Um, that was addressed today, I know, in the OSPI uh, guidance and talking about some funds that are being put towards supporting families who don't have um, internet services, but we know that that's not necessarily going to reach all of our families in Cheney. So at some point, um, we can move to trying to provide some places for students to come to have, um, to be able to be connected to the internet. So tentatively, the schedule uh, would be in this um, with these specific days, the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Tuesday, Thursday, would be an 8.30 to 1 o'clock schedule. So students would arrive at school um, and be provided or have breakfast. Um, they would have to go through all of the safety protocols, the entry um, screening, the health screening to make sure that, they're, that no one is sick coming into the building. They would have breakfast, then they'd have that specific time with um, teachers. Um, adhering to the Department of Health guidelines. So again, that goes back to the six foot distancing, um, the wearing of masks and washing hands, um, making sure we have hand sanitizer on hand um, for those things, um, but getting that time to interact and work with teachers and have the services they need. They'd have lunch at 1130 um, and the end of the day would be one o'clock. Um, we know this will have busing um, that would be a big part or component of this. Again, I want to emphasize that these are preliminary plans. 
This is not set in stone. This is our starting point. Um, and depending on how long we are in that stage, in stage three, um, might depend on how many more students we might be able um, to pull in to serve. The other thing I want to make sure you know of um, that it says up at the top is for, for this piece, um, the projected start date would be um, September 14th, um, not on the September 8th. Um, that, that the first day of distance learning will begin. And there are many reasons for that. One of them being, we want all students to have time to participate in their core classroom instruction. Um, we will be addressing social emotional needs um, from the very first day of school. And we wanna make sure that all students are included in that um, and able to, to take part and build community in their classrooms. Um, so that's one reason for that. Another reason is we have a lot of phone calls to be made. The case managers will be reaching out to all of these students we've been identified. Um, and, and it's really going to be, it, are you comfortable sending your student in for this um, small group face-to-face um, -face work? Um, so this, these are our preliminary plans. And I want to talk just briefly about some of our next steps. And I'll, I'll, because I'm talking about that right now, I want to skip straight to that. Um, there will be um, a parent webinar tomorrow evening um, as students with disabilities um, parent webinar to, to get more information um, around what the supports are, are going to be. If a student doesn't fall within the threshold of um, the 50% or more um, services being provided in, in, the, in the special ed um, services, then there will be other supports in place. So we do have plans to support in distance learning um, for all of our special ed students. So more information tomorrow night at 530. And in fact, I believe a message just went out um, about that. Um, so you should be getting that information with the link to attend that webinar. Of course, it will be recorded also just like this one is. And also we'll be launching a survey tomorrow um, to the all of this uh, parents of students with disabilities. So those are two steps that we're taking right now. I um, wanted to make sure you are aware of. We have a distance learning work group who has another meeting scheduled tomorrow. We have a hybrid model work group because we know we need to be planning for that stage and what that's going to look like in those next few stages of what of um, bringing students back. Um, on August 12th, we'll have another board meeting where we will be presenting the plan that is submitted to OSPI uh, before two weeks before school starts. Um, and then Rob, I'm gonna let you talk about the analyzing of the stages every two weeks. Yeah, thank you, Annie. An important part of our um, conditional reopening plan is to be able to analyze what the current situation is with regard to COVID so that we can move between stages um, when it's safe to be able to do so. Um, the plan at this point is to be able to continue to meet with the Department of Health and Spokane Regional Health Department analyze the COVID situation so that we can make decisions to be able to increase on-site learning for students when it's safe to do so, so that we can communicate with parents. One of the things I don't want to do with the stages is to go in and out a whole bunch of times from three to four, four back to three, and we want to have consistency for our families, and that's an important piece. So really analyzing those um, specific data within um, our county is going to be an important aspect of that. The slide that Annie showed uh, previous to this as well, this is an important piece for us. This is an opportunity for us to begin to bring students back on campus and to have success. If we can start small with a, a small number of students and have success within the cri criteria that we have to meet, I think that allows us then to be able to make the argument that we can build upon that and have more students back on campus in a safe manner. So I want us to look at that as an opportunity to be able to prove that we can do this and we can move forward in these stages to be able to support students. All right, we're going to touch on a few frequently asked questions. I know there are many more that are coming tonight, and we will take those from the Q&A room and put them together and have on an FAQ sheet. Um, but I wanted to touch on a couple that have been um, big points that have come up lately. One of them is around technology. A big piece of what we did last spring was getting Chromebooks to students. Um, we had some struggles with some of that process. Um, so I want you to know where we're at with that. So technology, we have purchased laptops for each teacher, 370 of them. They're actually being installed within classrooms now with monitors. Um, we have ordered 2,500 additional Chromebooks. 
And all of this occurs through the capital levy that we passed last November. So that is due to the support of our taxpayers. So a big thank you. That's what's allowed that to happen and has been very fortunate that we have that opportunity to do so now. The Chromebook should be in. Um, last I heard is that they were gonna be shipped on August 15th. So let's cross our fingers that they're all here. That will give us 4,800 Chromebooks within our district. So virtually one-to-one, -one, which is a, a big piece to be able to support our families in the distance learning model. We also know that there are internet issues. We have some hot, hot spots to be able to share, but we're gonna be looking for opportunities to increase internet access for parents. Also considering the potential of bringing in some students on site if they don't have access to the internet to be able to have support within that distance model. So we'll consider that and have more information to come. A big piece of the difficulty with the distance model is around childcare. And, and I understand the difficulty and it breaks my heart when I get an email that you know, describes you know, two parents working and young children and how we're gonna make this work or a single parent. And I understand those things as we're looking at how to support our families. A big part of that, I think we have to work together with our community partners. How do we determine ways to support our families? How do we work with our churches? How do we work with our rec centers? How do we work with Eastern or other community partners to be able to provide support in this area? So there will be more information coming about childcare because we know this is a significant issue for our families. Grading is something that's come up a lot. Um, last spring, OSPI had dictated that, you know, where students were at the time of the closure, um, they, they were to receive that grade and they couldn't go backwards. It was basically a do no harm concept. And while I agree and support that at that time, because we're in a difficult situation, we know that many families had concerns about that and want us to be grading student work. And we need to. We need to provide feedback on student achievement and assessment. And so students will receive grades as we move forward with distance learning. And of course, when we're back on site, they will receive grades. So that is a change from last year and we'll continue to work on that. And we'll still be standards based in many ways, but students will receive grades. Meal service questions have come up a lot. Uh, this spring, what we did is we had delivery systems with our school buses and paraeducators and we delivered at multiple schools and sites across the district to any student and any family. And that's an awesome thing. What we've heard from OSPI is that we'll be delivering meals to students who qualify for free and reduced lunch. So now more than ever, it's important that families fill out the free and reduced lunch form if that's something they qualify for so that we can support families. We don't have specific details on what that looks like, but we will provide meal services during distance learning. Athletic questions, I received many. A district eight, which is a part of the GSL that we're in and the region that we're in, has determined that all sports have been postponed until January. The WIA, which is a state agency, has moved sports seasons. Um, so basically what we're gonna be looking at is a sports season from January to the end of June. So they've extended the last athletic season all the way through June. So there's gonna be a lot of um, condensed sports seasons. I think there's seven weeks between January and June and more information as changes come um, with regard to athletics as well, because we know activities, band, extracurricular, all of those types of things are important to our families and students as well. And so I just, I wanna close with this. Um, I, I know distance learning is not optimal. I know this is not the perfect solution for our families, and I apologize for that. Um, we will work hard to be able to get back on site when it's possible. I just wanna remind us that this is a healthcare situation, right? This is a situation that we're in due to a pandemic and we're dealing with the health and safety of students and staff and families and, and making decisions based on that. And I apologize for any hardships that this causes our families, but I want you to know that we're committed to working on ways to be able to support, whether it's with childcare, whether it's with nutritional services, whether it's in any other way. So please know those things. And, we want our students back. I know you want your students back and we're going to work to do so when it's safe. And hopefully that's sooner rather than later if we all do our part and we can change the metrics and the numbers within the county and get our students back as safely and as soon as possible. I wanna thank you for being here tonight, for giving your time. Thank you for your questions. If you have additional questions, please continue to email. I try to respond as quickly as I can to email, but appreciate all of your support and everything you do. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.